I have hope I can do something. So you guys ready for a really awesome story? Do you guys like stories? Yeah, stories are one of those things that, I don't know if sometimes it's just maybe just the way the storyteller is. You know, some, a really, really good storyteller has the ability just to grab everyone's attentions and everyone's ears kind of perk up and the story rolls on. Sometimes it's just about the content of what they're talking about. Uh, one of the cool things about stories as we share them as a spiritual family is that when we have stories that, in which Jesus is at the center, it adds this whole other layer of depth and complexity and just, it's an amazing thing. And so today, in our rhythm of series, of teaching series, you know, most often we uh, have a series where we're working through a book of the Bible, things like that, and those are all really good things. But sometimes in our rhythm of family, it's good to just pause and to stop and hear a story of the, something that God is doing in our community, in our midst. And we know that there are hundreds and hundreds of stories we could share, many, many amazing things happening, and this is one of them. And this is a story that I've been really excited to sh for us to share together as family for a long, long time. Uh, some of you will know Lawrence and Cheryl Vandermark. They may be new to you, or some of you will know a little bit about their story. But this morning is about me getting out of the way and, and for us as a community together hearing this story about how God was working and moving and challenging and encouraging them forward. And I think there's something when a good story happens, not for us to look at the individuals telling the story, but to, for us to together have eyes open to see how God is in the middle of everything that we're talking about. And so that's what we want to do this morning, is share this story from within and talk about and learn together as family. So I just want to pray to set us up, and then we're going to jump in. So join me, please. So God, um, as already has been our heart this morning, we want to keep you at the center. Jesus, thank you for the way you bring hope and healing and transformation into areas of pain and brokenness and despair. And Jesus, I pray that as we share the stories, as we talk about this together, that there is a sense, a unifying sense together here in this room that you are good and perfect. And God, you are a God who loves us and cares for us and is right there beside us and wants to partner with us. And so Jesus, thank you for opportunity you give us and thank you for the way you use community to sharpen and challenge and make us who we are. And so we want to be open to what you have to say to us this morning. 
Jesus, we pray these things in your powerful name. Amen. So please join me in welcoming Lawrence and Cheryl Vandermark. Yeah, so I'm really, really super pumped about this morning and so glad you guys are here. For those of you who don't know you, though, just, you know, to set the stage, start us all off, can you just share a little bit about who you are, why you're here, kind of how long you've been a part of the Meeting House, all those kind of just basic things that help us understand why we're doing this. Sure, that's great. Thanks, uh, Matt. Um, yeah, we have uh, been part of the Meeting House for about 15 years uh, when we used to be small and knew everybody's name. Um, and so it's been great to see the growth. And uh, so we've been involved with Meeting House for a fair bit of time. Um, if we kind of flash back to kind of our, our pre-stage uh, here, uh, we have three kids, and uh, Tegan, Graydon, and Bridgley. And uh, we were living up in Carlisle, Ontario, just north of Waterdown. And uh, I work for the OPP uh, as a police officer, and my wife's a doctor of chiropractic. And she had a successful practice here in uh, Oakville. And uh, our kids went to school, just uh, in the neighborhood school around us. And, um, you know, I'd play pickup hockey. So we had a fairly normal Canadian life. Cool. So now tell us then. Obviously, we're here because of your connection with Haiti, with Mission of Hope. We showed that video on the Mission of Hope. Uh, as a church, we aren't directly connected with them, although we cheer them on in what they're doing. But that is an organization. We want to show you that video because it kind of captures and snapshots a lot of the programs and initiatives they are involved with as an organization. And they're near and dear to your hearts as you partnered with them. So tell us, how did this family go from everything's cool, we're here, we're part of the meeting house, to decide to pick up and move to Haiti? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, it's uh, been a long time. It had been a long time that God had been planting seeds in our lives about Haiti and missions. And um, we had uh, always had a little bit of a, a seed planted, I guess, for going into uh, short-term missions, as we thought. And uh, so we had um, gotten to a point where we decided to go um, on a short-term mission trip down to Haiti. And uh, we had seen it in the bulletin right, uh, at the meeting house once with the uh, group of Canadians that go down from Brethren Christ Church, and we always thought, well, we'll go with that, that church if, if we ever decide to go down. So um, we had uh, gone on short-term missions there, and God has been, uh, had been slowly working on our hearts and uh, became, got us to a point where we really realized that God was saying, this is what I want you to do. Um, and uh, that was always, you know, something that we kind of think and go, do you really want us to do that? I mean, we had, like Lawrence said, the all-Canadian family, three kids and a dog in the great suburban house and um, all that stuff. And uh, great careers, and uh, we were secure and all that. And so it was, was uh, very kind of convicting and, and almost like, oh, well, are we going to be crazy if we do that? You know, so... Um, we had uh, gotten to a point where we knew that God had said, this is what I want you to do, and uh, we stepped out in faith and uh, did that. And really that came um, when Meeting House was talking a lot about simplifying your life, and we were going through a lot of that and following Christ and stepping out of culture, not necessarily physically, but with um, the stuff you have or what's important to you and putting Jesus at the center of your life. And we were getting close to making a decision on going uh, full-time to Haiti. Um, and uh, we were in church, and Tim Day was speaking on uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, he had said, when you're truly following Jesus, everybody will look at you and say, you're crazy. And we looked at each other and said, all right, guess we're going to Haiti. Because <laughs> we had had a lot of people say, oh, you're crazy to leave your jobs and everything like that. So, yeah. And so what, how did you get connected then with Mission Hope? It was a short-term trip. And maybe you can tell us a little bit more about them as an organization, just so we get a sense of who they are and what they do. Yeah, we uh, originally were scheduled to go in about 2006 um, and uh, on a short-term team. That was canceled because of some unrest in the country. Um, which we thought we were really meant to go. And so we were really kind of questioning why would this be canceled? Is, you know, are we not supposed to go or something? And um, in 2007, we went down and for, for a two week stint, uh, Cheryl worked in the medical fields down there and I worked in some construction things. And um, at that point, we could see kind of the vision that had happened over a year. So it's neat looking back now seeing God's plan. Um, so then we 
uh, like Cheryl said, got more involved with Mission of Hope. And so down in, in Haiti, um, Mission of Hope is a Christian non-denominational uh, organization down there. Um, and Jesus is the center of the organization. And we, that actually takes physical place as well because in the mission compound where we lived and worked, uh, the church is right in the center. Um, and uh, it's a wonderful church and um, exciting to be in. Um, and so around, around the church, there's uh, different things. We have a school, uh, school and education. Uh, there's an orphanage there. There's food distribution. There's a medical program. Um, and there's all sorts of uh, other programs that uh, we'll touch on. Yeah, so Mission Hope approached us to go down and speak. So Lawrence, they asked him if he would come and run the site development, site, site operations of the Mission of Hope because it was growing so much at the time. And um, they asked me to start off their medical uh, section, which they were just starting and needed someone to lead that. Yeah, so tell us about them. You're just practically speaking, you know, family, three kids, living in Carlisle, and now you're going. So what, what did the, how did the kids involved? Were they thinking, yeah, let's do it, Mom and Dad? Or were they, how are, how are the kids feeling? How, how are they involved in the kind of the decision? Um, our kids were always part of the decision because um, we really felt that God wasn't just calling mom and dad into full-time missions, that he calls your whole family into full-time missions. So we were very um, purposeful about talking to the kids about that and saying we believe that God is calling you to come down as well, and there's going to be great reasons for that. And, and so we involved them right from the beginning. They came down for a month to Haiti with us before we made the final decision. Um, so the kids spent a month there chasing tarantulas, et cetera. And uh, th that went well um, <laughs> for them, not me. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, they were a big part of the great Vandermark garage sale, which was when we sold a lot of our stuff and uh, put some stuff in storage, but really got rid of everything. We sold our house and uh, headed down to Haiti with just a few hockey bags and um, brought a Canadian young uh, teacher with us from Wayne Fleet Brethren in Christ Church here in, in Ontario. And um, it was an adventure. That's good. So uh, a big part of this story, we don't want to you know, hang on it too long, but a big part of this story is you having the sense of God moving and changing and shaping you in the context of community here to step out and you know, as crazy as it sounds to maybe some friends or people in your home church, you were going to take this step, never anticipating that the earthquake was going to come. Um, so maybe you can talk to us about January 12, 2010. Mm -hmm. January 12, 2010. Well, we moved down September 2008, and at that time, God didn't tell us we were going to have to go through a major earthquake, <laughs> but uh, well, we might have said no. But um, So we headed down a year and a half prior to, and uh, January 12, uh, January 10th, January 12, 2010, um, at 4.50 in the afternoon. I had just come back from the medical clinic and was up and just come into the house. Lawrence had just come back from site operations and was just coming up to the porch. And I was sitting at the kitchen table. I remember sitting at the kitchen table just on my computer. And I remember my computer starting to just jiggle a little bit and starting to hear a bit of a sound. And I thought, that's strange, what's that? Um, we have trucks that go by, and maybe it was a big truck. This is all in split seconds. And then all of a sudden, it continued, and my computer started to really jump off, and then I heard the sound start, and this low rumble, and it just grew and grew and grew and grew and grew until it was like a jet engine airplane taking off. And we live in a missionary uh, housing complex on the Mission Hope compound, and it's all concrete buildings made out of concrete. When, by the time I got to the end of my kitchen table, the entire concrete house was alive. My walls were going like this, and my ceiling was doing this, and the floor was doing this. Everything started crashing off the walls. Um, I still didn't know what was going on. We're in Haiti. We're used to hurricanes, not earthquakes. And so I had not practiced earthquake, uh, what do you do in an earthquake? Um, and so some people say they still thought it was an airplane landing on the buildings or something like that. And uh, my one son came screaming to me out of his bedroom, just screaming hysterically out of fear. I grabbed him and I reached over him and I was still thinking, what do I do? Do I go under the table? Do I go, um, I didn't know what to do. Do I stand up, sit down? <laughs> Don't know. Um, and my wonderful police officer husband, who's so good in emergency situations like that, uh, realized what was going on. He ran into the house and all I remember is him going, get out, get out, get out. And he grabbed my hand 
And that put me into motion. And I started yelling the same as all the kids were coming from their various locations, out of their bedrooms, et cetera, towards the door. And I'm screaming, get out, get out, everybody out. Um, and one of my girls on the porch ran in and then out. And she didn't know what was safer. She was running all over, out, out, out. And we get out to the porch. And Lawrence says, keep running, keep running. Because again, him knowing we're living in a two-story concrete building with another missionary family above us, um, that if it comes down, we still weren't far enough away from the building. So he said, keep going, keep going. We're all running out. I remember running out into the porch and seeing the stairs. We had three stairs down going like this, and you're trying to run over it. And as I'm running out, I remember glancing over to the missionary house next door and their car that was sitting there. I remember seeing it bounce on the ground. And we kept running out. We ran out to the end of uh, where it was safe away from the building and counted all our kids and realized that it was a big earthquake and the earth rested. And then it started again, rested, started again. We had three kind of in a row. We turned back and looked at the house, and it was still standing, which was a miracle. And it was cracked, but still standing. And then we turned around and looked out, and, and Lawrence was explaining a bit about Mission of Hope, but we're up on a little bit of a hill, and we can see the entire city of Port-au-Prince. We're only just a, a little bit out of Port-au-Prince. And we turned and looked to Port-au-Prince, and all we could see was an entire... The entire city, which is about the size of Burlington with three million people in it, covered in a cloud of concrete dust. It looked like a huge bomb had gone off across the entire city. The whole thing was covered in concrete dust, plumes of it. And our jaws dropped open. We looked at each other and we just realized, man, this is huge. We looked to our local villages where we do all of our ministry, and we saw the same thing, those all up in, in dust. Of course, that was the hardest part for us because we work with so many, um, we have so many friends in those villages. And uh, we looked at that, and um, we were very fortunate at the time to have a fa another family from the meeting house who was in our home church originally, followed, followed our story down, and then literally followed us down <laughs> again later. And they were there for those 10 months. Um, and Grant Rumford uh, was a Halton paramedic, and so he was with us, working with me in the medical area for those 10 months. And he was there, and he said, I'll grab the ambulance. And I said, I'll grab any team members that we had down there of mission teams that had anything to do with medical, and we'll meet you at the clinic. Looking at Port-au-Prince, we knew we might be one of the only places for people to go, and that was um, certainly in that area the truth. And we ran down to the front. By the time I got to the front gate, it was probably about seven minutes after the earthquake. And by that time, there was already the first tap-tap. A tap-tap is a Haitian um, uh, taxi. It's a pickup truck with a back where they just all shove in. And um, by the time I got to the front gate, there was tap, tap after tap, tap after tap, tap coming to the Mission of Hope full with um, injured eight, nine, ten people to a tap, tap, severe traumatic injuries, limbs um, missing, uh, gouged, uh, bones sticking out everywhere, um, just traumatic, traumatic injuries. Some passed away already, some almost there. Um, we just let them in, let them in. I ran back up to the clinic uh, to be with Grant. There was three of us that could do any type of procedures. It reminds me in the Bible when God gave um, the Jewish people a tiny army against a large army or march, having to march around the walls of Jericho and having to work in faith with such little um, ability and, and that. And uh, so uh, we had uh, well over 100, probably 150 uh, injured people lying everywhere. We started to triage some. We had to pass over some that we could help. Uh, we worked for 33 hours straight um, without taking a break, and they just kept coming and kept coming. At the end of 33 hours, we uh, slept for six, and we started again another 10 hours of the same stuff coming through, at which point diesel ran out in the country and nobody could get to us. Um, by about uh, day three, we started to have doctors and nurses come in from uh, the United States and Canada who had helped out at Mission of Hope before, and we started to launch a grand-scale uh, medical disaster relief program throughout Port-au-Prince. 
Um, we worked, we set up two field hospitals and worked in two other broken down hospitals, uh, about 150 medical personnel every week. And that's when Matt came down and joined a medical team to uh, one of our, our locations. And, um, and we were uh, able to continue on with that. We ended up setting up a surgical suite at our mission complex, which ended up being one of the only sterile surgical units in the greater Port-au-Prince area, which was a huge blessing to many people. And uh, we uh, continued to work hard for the next while. Yeah, obviously a, you know, unexpected, massive scale disaster, destruction, loss of life, people injured, just a huge, huge situation you find yourselves in. Um, one of the things we, as we were talking about this, that I just wanted to ask together is that, you know, sometimes in those moments of complete brokenness and chaos and pain, as we follow Jesus and we, as we view things kind of with Jesus at our center, we see different glimmers of hope. I don't know what the term would be, but these little pop-ups of hope, of life, of opportunity, of love in the midst of all the darkness and pain. And I'm just wondering if you could just share a little bit of in those moments of craziness, of lack of sleep, just running on empty, you know, being thrown into situations that you probably shouldn't be in, but dealing with, um, what was that like, you know, representing Jesus in the midst of all that? We saw God in so many different ways throughout all of that. Um, so many good things came out of something that was so terrible. And, I mean, even from uh, God sending the Rumford family and Grant Rumford as a paramedic for that 10 months um, was just a huge blessing. But um, even the night of the earthquake, there's lots of young men and, men and women that we work with at uh, Mission of Hope um, that help with our mission teams in translating English to Creole. And being that I was the only one there that night fluent in Creole, um, some of these young men uh, went through the earthquake and had family members in, in trouble because of it, extended family members that had died. And we had some of those guys show up at Mission of Hope that night just to help us, knowing that we had a team of Canadians that couldn't speak English, just to help translate and help uh, medically. And actually, I'm really excited that one of them is here with us in Canada for the summer. His name is Sadrak. Sadrak, can you stand up? I'm going to embarrass Let's welcome him. Welcome Sadrak here. Yeah. <laughs> Sadrak is a very good friend of ours. He um, is the one that's responsible for me being able to speak Creole. <laughs> and he's one of the young men that, that showed up that night just to say, you know, hey, what can I do for you? I remember him coming in and, and he just hugged me for like, I don't know how long, five minutes maybe, Sadrak. <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> and I think up until that moment, I just hadn't stopped and breathed and, and even uh, cried a tear or anything. But he just came in and just held me for uh, a long time. And, and we just basically were just so glad to see each other alive and everybody alive. So thank you for, for sh giving up your time and coming to Mission of Hope to help that night, Saturday. Now you can sit down. <laughs> Um, but also we had um, hundreds of thousands, thousands at least of Haitians across the country come to Christ because of the earthquake. Our church holds about a thousand. We had standing room only. We had people out on the grass, um, just overflow of people um, coming to Christ because of the earthquake. And, and that was just a huge blessing too. And in addition, uh, we were able to get funding in the long run that came down which helped to jumpstart a lot of our programs. And on the visual summary that you saw of Mission of Hope, we have now the home program for people that lost their home in earthquakes. We have an amputee women's program, um, three cords, and just all tons. There's so many great things that God has done um, through such terrible suffering. Yeah, and, and uh, the impossible question that I know I shouldn't ask, but obviously I'm going to ask. Uh, <laughs> I know it's, it's impossible. It's crazy to say how... You know, how can you boil it down to a few things that maybe God taught you through this season? You know, even prior to the earthquake, just that step of faith as a family and then finding yourself in that situation and then all the opportunity and involvement post-earthquake as well. If you could boil it down, uh, what would you say are a couple things that God really formed in you, um, for you guys as parents, also for your kids, and for us as a Meeting House family to hear? What would you, what would you say? Yeah, a couple kind of retrospectively looking back, um, which is a great view, um, and, and so much, 
you feel so much smarter when you look back. Um, it, one is stepping out and out of your comfort zone. Um, we had to do that not only making the decision to go to Haiti, um, but also uh, with our kids. They had to become uncomfortable, um, but knowing they were supported. Um, so getting out of your comfort zone, knowing that, it, that you're following Jesus, um, that's a hugely important step that we've tried to follow the whole way along. Um, through the disaster uh, and multiple disasters down there, again, getting out of your comfort zone, following Jesus, and uh, that way being open to listen to what, what God's trying to teach you. Uh, if we hold ourselves in that bubble uh, too much, uh, we won't get to experience those kinds of things. Now, saying that doesn't mean everybody's got to get on a plane and go somewhere. Um, you know, getting out of your comfort zone involves a whole bunch of different stuff for a whole bunch of different people. So I think that's an important point on that as well is um, uh, just do something crazy, right? And, and that's for crazy Jesus. for Jesus, right? <laughs> So that's, that's going to be our new slogan on the, on the shirts. And um, the other thing that God's really taught us um, is that he will sustain you through a lot of trouble. Um, and without, without relying on Jesus, um, we would not have been able to get through any of it. Um, and a lot of families have troubles. A lot of people have individual troubles. Uh, he'll sustain you. Uh, sometimes it doesn't look the way that I want it to look. Um, but he's going to sustain you and uh, just relying on him and he'll keep pushing you forward. Yeah, our kids you asked about too. Um, we've seen already great blessings that have come out of um, just the work we've done down there and their experience down there coming back. For example, our oldest daughter, um, she didn't want to come back because she loves the babies in our orphanage and they're like her babies. And so she was like tearing her away from her babies, um, which is very difficult to come back. But she had to come back into... Um, high school here, and which can be a, a difficult thing. She goes to a great Christian high school. But she came back and shared her story of just from her perspective of um, life in Haiti. And by doing that, she then inspired her grade 10 class, and she was a student leader for their mission trip that came down to Haiti this year. And uh, they've sponsored a kid at Mission of Hope, and she was able to get to the point where she said, I know... Um, now, why God sent me there and why he brought me back, because without doing that, none of these kids that went in my group would have had their life-changing experience. And uh, we know she's not done with Haiti yet. She wants to go into the medical field and go back down and work in Haiti. So, Yeah, it's so amazing. You know, we, we talk about or use the image of if, you know, world uh, history and, and timeline is just this flat, calm lake and Jesus comes on the scene as this huge boulder and drops in the middle and it creates these ripples and impact that impacts that ripples, that ripples, that ripples. Sometimes you make one step of faith and you have no idea what's going to be around the corner or how that's going to, you know, a choice you make impacts other. I think of the Rumford family. You guys are in home church together. You guys decide. They track with you. They decide for 10 months we're going. They're, you know, critical to assisting and being a part of the team. Just amazing things that ripple through. Even your family. Maybe you can just share about how your family changed even over the, the last little bit. Yeah, we, like I said before, we had uh, three kids, and uh, we went down with three, with the plan to keep three, and um, we came back with five. So, uh, so not we had not five not more, five more yeah. just five in total. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we, added, we added two uh, girls, uh, Anna and Mina, and so, uh, again, it's, that was a big ripple um, that uh, just, again, God's outpouring. And, um, and just living outside your comfort area, um, we didn't go down with that intention at all. So, um, you know, a couple, a couple talked with God about that one. You know, I said, are you sure? Is this what I'm hearing? Um, so, uh, but yeah, they've, they've been a great addition uh, to our family. Yeah, that's great. One of the uh, passages when we were talking about, are there any passages of scripture that really ministered to you that impacted you while you were there and living through all the things you've experienced, uh, Psalm 116. And so we had part of that in our quotes earlier. And uh, in home church this week, I know some home churches, as summer is approaching, have kind of shifted schedules. So if you're not in a home church this week, maybe you're not in a home church right now, certainly uh, I would encourage you to read over Psalm 116. And then the next time you're hanging out with some friends, 
um, you know, grabbing coffee or whatever that looks like. Just bring out, bring out that passage and talk about it in light of this story. So could you just share a little bit about why Psalm 116 meant so much in those moments and continues to for you guys? Yeah, for sure. Psalm 116 wasn't a psalm that I really was all that familiar with or read very often, but um, as you read through it, you'll probably see why it's important. Um, But we had a very good Haitian friend that was trapped in a building. We have many, many stories like that, but one that was trapped in a building for four hours. Um, He was pinned down by his teacher who had died from the earthquake on top of him with concrete on top of uh, the teacher. Um, He heard... 30 or more classmates of his die one by one, stop making noises. Uh, He tried to save one of them beside him with his free arm and couldn't. For four hours, he was trapped uh, thinking he would die. He got to a point of telling God that he was okay with that. But if God was to let him live, that he would live every moment trying to... um, glorify God in in everything that he did. And Psalm 116 was the psalm that he cried out to God with in that moment. Um, Not knowing this, Lawrence, uh, very shortly after the earthquakes, uh, searching in his Bible and and crying out to God as well, really felt God say, Psalm 116, look at Psalm 116. And uh, also the Rumford family that we talked about, their eldest daughter, Michelle, same thing she was reading, and God said to her, Psalm 116. And they all talked later and went, hey, you read that too? Oh, hey. You know, so um, it has a lot of meaning. Yeah, so that will be a good one for you guys to check out and talk about. Um, there are so many stories, as we even got together and, and talked about some things on how do, you, how do you cover a story with so many different layers and dif- so much complexity and challenge and emotion in such a short time. And so we've tried to give you guys a bit of a, a snapshot of this journey of a family saying, Jesus, we want you to be at the center of our family. We want to involve uh, together as a whole family unit, make these decisions together to step out, find themselves in situations they weren't a- a- anticipating or expecting. And this whole piece. So I would encourage you, I don't know if you know Sharon Lawrence, but uh, take some time, even after the service, they'll be hanging out at the Resource Center. Please come by. Uh, We were, as this was all unfolding, we were giving you little updates and praying for uh, you guys as a family. So I know it's it's sometimes weird when you actually don't know each other, but there's a sense of, I kind of feel like I know you. We've been praying together and for you. So, But I think it would be encouragement to this family for you to stop by and just say hey afterwards. But we do want to take a couple quick questions for you guys, if that's cool. See what's kind of come in and just see what what's floating around here. So if we have anything, uh, Paul says, you mentioned that you began to simplify your lives. What kind of things did you do and what were the most difficult simplifications? Uh, Mine was pretty easy. It was very difficult. It was my house. I love my house. (laughs) Um, He still loves that house. I still love that house. (laughs) Do you drive by in a creepy way? I do. It's it's actually now his brother's house. Oh, we get to visit. Oh, yeah, exactly. I get to walk in. (laughs) Um, No, but it was was my house, and I finally got to a stage, and Cheryl will probably remember this, where you got to a stage and said, it's a thing. I love it, but it's a thing. Um, And so for me, it was, that's just something in my head that really symbolized something that it was a thing that, um, it was great, but it was a thing. Yeah, anything for you, Cheryl? Um, I think for me, it was just more, yeah, like kind of giving go of all that, letting go of all that status. You know, you worked so hard to get your, your, we lived in a basement apartment with Tegu when she was a baby, and then you get to your starter home, and you got to the home we thought we'd be in forever, and, and that whole, the whole package of that to be able to, to have to step back and let kind of all that go was probably the hardest part, Yeah but being able to turn that over to God and go with it. So let me follow up then. If, as that was the hardest part of this journey, now that you're back in Canada, back in the area, do you find... We live simil- in a tent. A yeah, tent. <laughs> it's going to be cold soon. Yeah. Uh, do you, are you finding that as you're making choices now in the everyday, you're looking at it in just a completely different way? Like that's thought of your practice, um, your work, all those kind of things. How does it continue to ripple then? Yeah, it continues to ripple and... and I think you can really try and grasp the whole thing um, on a whole, or you can just look at your little decisions that you're making every day. And say, is this enriching my life? Is this enriching somebody else's life? And this is, is this enriching my family's life? Okay, well, then I'm going to invest in that, whether it's money, whether it's time, whether it's, I'm going to invest in that. Uh, if it's something that you go back and you're like, you know what, I probably shouldn't have done that. 
you know, then maybe the next time you go, okay, I'm going to remember that. So it's, it's more just those, all those little decisions that kind of lead to the bigger decision. So we're out of time, so I can't really bring up another question. But just really short, in 30 seconds, if you were to say, here's how you can pray for our family, what would that be? I think just what you touched on right now is how you can pray for our family, that now that we're back here, just pray that we can continue to um, not jump into getting comfortable again with the whole culture, cultural uh, stuff and materialism and all that kind of stuff, that we can continue to be um, an example for others, to our kids, and that we can continue to, um, yeah, I guess just live counterculturally. Yeah. Okay, well, let's do that. Would you join and stand with me, and we're going to pray for these guys as a way of closing together. <clears throat> So, Father, thank you uh, for the way you use different parts of our uh, spiritual body, our family, to impact and shape us and challenge us and encourage us. And so thank you for the Vandermark family. God, thank you for the amazing things you've been calling them to and challenging them with. God, we're just mindful of the way you use them in such a significant way in the face of disaster. And uh, many of the results of that we'll, we still don't know. Um, and so, God, as those things continue to impact and shape them and then shape other people, God, we just pray that you work through those things. Thank you, God, that you do move into areas of destruction and bring uh, glimmers of hope and peace and love. And, God, thank you that as agents, as people who follow Jesus, we are those ambassadors uh, of this new kingdom who go out and do those kind of things. And so we do pray uh, for the Vandermark family as they settle back here, uh, also for our whole community, that you continue to stretch and teach us of what it means to give up expectation of what we deserve and what we want, uh, to buy into the pressure of culture to have more stuff and to build ourselves with status and esteem. God, help us to know how to let go of those things so that we can love and serve and care for other people better and more meaningfully. God, it is, like Lauren said, it is just about um, letting go and it's just stuff. So God, help us to have wisdom to know where to draw those lines and continue to shape us and move us forward as family, as community together. We love you, Jesus, and we want to continue to be molded and shaped by you. Amen.